crooked, but... So anyway, today we're going to talk about x-ray tubes, production of x-rays, and some of the linear accelerators. Um, that was chapters 3 and 4 out of Khan. Just so you know, my lectures don't follow Khan exactly, chapter by chapter. You've probably noticed that. And the reason is because some of those chapters are covered in other courses. Some of those sections, like there was a section in last class that was parent-daughter decay that I didn't cover, because that's going to be covered in nuclear medicine. Okay. And certain things that I cover will will uh, be overlapped in other courses. So I don't follow it to the letter. And also, I add a lot of things in my lectures that are not in Khan. Okay. Just so you know, it's not if, if they don't look exactly the same, it's, it's intentional. OK, first, a little bit of history. Um, X-rays were discovered in 1895, which was a year, it's hard to see, it? it's a year before the discovery of, uh, of radioactivity. Is that too dark? I guess it's right now. I can see. Is that okay? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you got a screen. All right, so I might fall asleep. So, uh, the, so in 1895, that's the discovery. That's the year of the discovery of X-rays, and they were discovered by uh, this this uh, German gentleman here, William Röntgen. And um, that picture on the left is we saw that at the last lecture. That picture on the left is the hand of, his, of William's wife. There's a nice link in, in here, right here, that it's a little movie about the discovery of x-rays. Let's see how bad this is going to work. So click on that link and it'll send you to a movie. It's a nice little, little movie about how Runkin discovered x-rays. Um, I don't know how well the speakers work on this. It's running a little slow. It might be running slow because it's recording. But anyway, I'll let you. I'll let you look at that. Oh, here it comes. No, it's running slow because the recording is taking up a lot of memory. I'll let you click on that. Anyway, it's a little dramatization of how he discovered X-rays and how he got his wife to come over and take a picture, an X-ray picture of his hand. But basically, uh, he was working with these tubes, these evacuated glass tubes. And uh, they were making these pretty lights, okay? So it looked like a light tube. And then he put, he put this tube in a box, and he, had a, and he had a phosphor plate outside the box. And he turned the tube on, and the phosphor plate glowed. Okay, so he knew that covering this tube with a box, these rays somehow were getting through this box, okay, that made the phosphor plate glow. And he knew that there was something special about a tube that's in a box that can make something outside the box glow. He knew that there was something special about these rays, and he called them X-rays. And this is really one of the biggest discoveries of our time. I mean, imagine, so once he, once he discovered that it glowed, then he, then he realized that he could um, see through, these rays would go through soft tissue, and would get stopped by things, hard things like bone. And once he discovered that, it, com it completely changed how we could look, we could, for, for once, look inside our bodies. Okay, rather than before, medicine was all about palpation and touching and feeling and seeing the outside of the body and, and, and looking at the symptoms of people just from the outside you know, or cutting people open. This is the first time that you could look inside the body. So it was huge for medicine. And his wife said, she said, uh, I have now seen my death when she saw her hand because at the time, and skeletons represented death. If you saw somebody's skeleton, I mean, the guy was dead. So uh, she was pretty freaked out by that. Uh, this is a, a schematic of an X-ray tube. This is not like this is not the X-ray tube that that Runkin used. This is a more modern one. And let's see if this movie works. It's just a quick movie. Maybe I shouldn't even try. Oh, here it is. Okay. So an X-ray tube is a is an envelope. It's a glass envelope, and it's evacuated. Why do you think it's evacuated? Okay, so it's an, right, I think this is a, it's a movie that shows in, what's happening inside the x-ray tube. Oh, there's no flash. Oh, and they have to install it. Okay, strike two. <laughs> okay, I'll let you guys play that. Um, all right, so what we're looking at here is a tube housing. Okay, so this grounds it. Just make sure that none of the high voltage that's inside here gets outside. So this is a tube housing. 
There's high voltage applied. This is a very simple schematic. You guys are going to learn a lot more detail in your diagnostic course, okay? This is just a very simple schematic so you guys get an understanding of the basic operation of the X-ray tube. So it's, there's a high voltage applied between the anode and the filament. Okay? Positive to the anode, negative to the filament. All right? So now, uh, what happens here? The filament has a current flowing through it. It's a high current. And the filament, uh, current is flow of electrons. The higher the current, the more electrons are flowing, right? So this is basically, think of this as a supply of electrons. That's what's supplying the electrons to the X-ray tube. And this, this anode right here is shaped like this because if I were to turn it around, it's a disc. It's a rotating disc. Okay, this is a side view of a rotating disc. So now, this, these electrons that are flowing in the filament are being what we call boiled off. There's so many of them, they're, bo they're coming off the, the filament. Then this minus and plus provide a voltage difference between these two uh, pieces of their, their context, really. There's a filament and an anode. They're providing a voltage difference. When there's an electron and there's a voltage difference, there's a force. Okay? And this force being applied on the electrons accelerates the electrons. The electrons then hit this metal uh, anode. When they hit the metal anode, they create what we're going to what we're going to describe later as what we call Bremsstrahlung or light radiation. Okay, and we'll describe the mechanism of that in a minute. So once they hit that, once they hit the anode, they create radiation that that uh, is deflected at 90 degrees through through a window. Now this housing right here is the glass housing that I'm talking about. And uh, usually the glass housing, there's some oil inside the housing to cool it down. Uh, so the glass housing has two, uh, two envelopes, an outer and an inner, and there's oil inside. This is a rotor, and this is the stator that turns. It's just basically a motor that turns the anode. And this is a vacuum tube. So again, my question before, why do you think it's evacuated inside? What happens if we have air in there? What would be the problem of having air in there? But not so, yeah, scatter. Yeah, scatter. There'll be some attenuation and some scatter. So these electrons that we want to move very quickly from here to here would start interacting with the air and creating other electrons and ions in the, in the envelope. Okay, so we want to evacuate that. We want to pull a vacuum in there. Then there's a thin window here, and then a collimator. Guys, the collimator is a device that restricts the beam to a certain size. Okay, and usually they're made of metal so that they can attenuate the radiation. And this is the effective radiation beam. Okay? So that's the basic, simplest explanation of an X-ray tube. Uh, and then, the, okay, the, the high voltage, let's talk about numbers. The high voltage is 80 to 140 kilovolts between the, between the two. Okay, kilo is 1,000 volts. So we can go up, we usually go up to 140 kilovolts. The higher the energy, the more penetrating the X-rays are. Okay? Now, uh, another terminology, tube current. Tube current is the number of electrons per second that flow from here to here. Okay. So two current electrons per second that flow from here to here. That is different than filament currents. Okay, so there's two types of currents. Maybe I'll turn that off. <laughs> I got a text. One of my physicist friends, yeah, I think he's you didn't get enough sleep. He says, I'm a good physicist. You're a great physicist. I just want you to know. <laughs> I think he, he was sleep deprived. He just had a baby. Just had a baby. Okay, anyway. Uh, so the two current is the number of electrons per second from here to here. And the other current that you need to know and not, just, and not get confused by is the filament current. That is the electrons per second that are flowing in this filament. Okay? And when we talk about, and there's two parameters that we talk about when we talk about uh, X-ray tubes, that's called MA, meaning milliamps, little m, big A, and KV. Milliamps is the filament current, and KV is the voltage applied across the, across the tube. Okay, MA and KV, those are, the, those are the two settings that you'll see on, a, on an X-ray tube. There's a couple of other settings, but those are the, the main ones. All right, enough, enough of the tube. Okay, and then there's this thing called added filtration. Most X-ray tubes that you see in a diagnostic department have the have added filtration that you could modify right on the tube itself. There's a little switch that you can change, and, they, and we put some added filtration in here. And the reason for that added filtration is, well, imagine if you're putting filtration, you're reducing the intensity of the beam, right? We know that it's going to anytime you put metal in the beam, we're going to reduce the intensity. But the advantage of added filtration is that you're taking away the low energy photons. And we'll see in a minute here that the energy spectrum of the photons coming out of here 
there's a spectrum. There's some high energy and there's some low energy photons. The low energy photons are bad. They're bad because uh, they just they come to the skin and they stop at the skin. They don't penetrate. So they don't contribute to the image. The non-image contrib contributing photons. So the low energy photons are just going to contribute to patient dose. We want to take those out. We take it out with a thin piece of um, aluminum uh, that's in the way of the beam. Okay, and this doesn't really that doesn't really affect the high energy photons. Okay. Um, and we're going to get into the word energy and the terminology of energy in a minute here. So these are just some pictures of examples of actual tubes. This is more like what uh, not Röntgen, but maybe his pre his um, successors were using. This is a, an early X-ray tube with two with two um, the two contacts, an anode, and then they had this other contact that would deflect the beam there too. I think this was I think this was a Crookes tube. Crookes tube is is later on. The Crookes tubes are the ones that people started using in uh, in the medical field. And these the early X-ray tubes were called Crookes tu Crookes tubes, like C R O O K S. This is today's X-ray tube in a, in its housing. And that's where the x-rays come out of. And here is the smallest x-ray tube, and that is a brachytherapy. Remember the word brachytherapy? That's internal radiation. Well, they came up with a tiny, tiny x-ray tube that um, is as small as a radioactive source. And they put them on a wire, and they send them inside the patient, and they turn it on, kind of like an x-ray tube. They turn it on, and it delivers dose, and then they turn it, on, turn it off when they want to stop the dose. And the, the x-ray tube I just showed you, there was a filament, and an anode, okay? Filament and anode. And this little mini x ray tube, the, by the way, the company is Zoft that makes this little x ray tube. And the way it works is there's an anode. Um, actually, the anode is out here, so this would be the anode. And this is the cathode. And um, there's a kill voltage between the anode and the cathode, and this whole thing is housed in um, is housed in a container, and it's liquid cooled. Um, the only thing about this is that because these materials are so small, and it doesn't, it's not a very efficient cooling. Um, they they only last a certain time, so they usually last a week for basic radiotherapy use. If they're using it every day. They last a week, and they have to replace it every week. So that's a little inconvenient. But people are using There's actually a few around in the area. So that's the smallest x-ray tube. All right, so I was talking about diagnostic x-ray tubes. There's a different kind of x-ray tube that we had when, where I first started working, and uh, this is called a therapy x-ray tube. A therapy x-ray tube is just what, it, what the name implies. It's, it's not used for imaging. It's used for therapy. It's used for treating something, okay? The things that we tri typically treat with this kind of tube are superficial things, um, skin carcinomas, uh, pretty much skin car carcinomas are the main, major thing that we treated. And there's two types of skin, it's basal cell and squamous cell, uh, and uh, the third one is melanoma, the worst one. So let's, let's uh, break this one down. This is the tube, the glass housing on the outside, the glass envelope, cathode shield, so there's the, there's the filament right here, filament. Okay, there's the shield for the filament, and then this is uh, this is made of thin glass, and then there's an, the X-ray beam comes up this way. There's a actually it comes through this beryllium window. It's a little hard to see, but there's a little window right there. So it comes through the beryllium window, and then there's a target here. And then this has a, a housing, and the housing is made of two materials: copper on the inside. This is copper, and this is copper, and then there's tungsten on the outside. Okay. That's the radiation shield for this target. And then there's some cooling things here. But what, is the, what do you see as the major difference between this tube and the one I showed before? It has the shield. Correct. It has a shield. The other one didn't have a shield. Another major difference. Is it, is it still evacuated? It's still evacuated. This target looks a little different. This one doesn't rotate. Remember on the other one I told you it was a disc that rotates? Well, the reason that 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 previous one rotates is for cooling. If you're always irradiating one spot, that spot's going to get really hot, hot, right? But if you rotate and you turn it, you're spreading out, you're spreading out the heat distribution. Okay. Now, um, with diagnostic tubes, you shoot a very, you shoot a very short burst of radiation with diagnostic. 
And the reason you usually shoot a very short burst is because if your burst was longer and the patient coughed or moved or fidgeted, the image would be blurry. Okay? And it would be a poor image for the radiologist. They couldn't be able to diagnose. Okay? So in diagnostic tubes, it's very important to show, shoot as short a burst as possible to reduce moving artifacts or moving or blurring of the image. When you're treating a patient, you're not taking an image. Okay, so you could stand to you can stand to deliver a longer, a longer dose or a longer period of time. So typically we would treat we treat a few minutes, a minute or two. Okay, and that's okay because we're not taking a picture. Okay? We don't want the patient to move too much, but if they move if they move a little bit, it's not the end of the world. We can just tell them not to move, but it's not going to affect an image because we're not taking an image. Okay, so let's go through the bullets. The hooded anode is used to prevent interference of secondary emission electrons. Now, what is, what is a secondary emission electron? It's an electron that gets created by the primary electron. The primary electron comes from the filament, interacts with the target. That's the primary. A secondary electron is the one that gets created when that electron interacts with an orbital electron. And it gives it energy, knocks it out of its orbital and gives it energy. Okay, that's a secondary electron. If you get a whole bunch of those going on out here, they're going to start creating ions in the, uh, sorry, they're not, not in the air, I was going to say in the air, but they're going to start creating uh, uh, an electric field. Okay, so they're going to build up. They're going to be emitted from this, from this material, and they're going to build up on the outside, and they're going to create an electric field. That electric field is going to counteract the electric field that is used for accelerating. Okay, so it's going to, it's going to disrupt it. That's a bad thing. So that's why we put this hood, put that hood to contain it inside. Uh, and then MA is lower in therapy tubes compared to diagnostic tubes due to the ability to use longer exposure times. Remember what I said about MA? It's the milliamps. What is the milliamps? You guys remember? What is MA? Uh, it's the something. What is it? What is it? What, what do you see? Current. The current, and current right? And A stands for amps. It's the current that's flowing through the filament. Correct. So the MA is lower in therapy tubes because to deliver radiation, we could extend the time so we could reduce the MA because we can deliver a longer time. So we don't, have to, we don't have to deliver the current very quickly. We can deliver over extended time, so we could lower this, because we're not restricted by time like we are in diagnostic. The exposure times can be longer since these tubes are not meant for imaging. Therefore, the patient movement is not a factor. Okay? Therapy tubes are not that common today due to electron therapy in the next. Uh, so these have gone by the wayside because most uh, radiation therapy centers have linear accelerators, and part of the of what comes with the linear accelerator is electron therapy. And electron therapy is superficial and it treats the same kind of diseases as this treats. This is actually a little better for superficial diseases. But people don't want to have this other machine and, and a dedicated room to it. So they just treat everything on the linear accelerator. Um, the reason that we have two metals here, why do we have copper and then tungsten? So the electrons that are emitted out of this anode are going to be attenuated by the copper. Okay, electrons have charge and they have mass, so they're easily attenuated. They're easily attenuated by copper and aluminum. So we don't need a high Z to attenuate uh, electrons. But these electrons will interact with copper and create photons. We don't want, we don't want uh, leakage radiation coming out of here, because then we're going to have to have lead, a lot of lead to contain leakage radiation. So we place a tungsten shield, and the atomic number of tungsten is high. Okay, I think it's uh, 74 or something. Uh, okay, atomic number of tungsten is high, so the copper attenuates the electrons that are coming off the target, secondary electrons, and then the tungsten shield attenuates the photons that are created by the electrons. Okay. I have a question. Now. Yeah. Um, why is there a cathode shield? What is that for? This cathode shield... Hmm. Let's see. Cath this cathode shield... Let me look that up. I'm not exactly sure. This may have something to do with... Um, uh, creating, uh, creating an electric field, or creating an initial electric field, so these electrons have a, have some potential. I'll look it up. I'm not exactly sure. I got one more question. Yeah. Um, what was the reason that the target doesn't spin on this? Oh. Well, what's the reason that the target does spin on the diagnostic tube? Well, it's for heat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Distribution. Dissipating heat, and we need to dissipate heat on diagnostic tubes. Um, a lot because we're getting a very short burst, very intense burst of electrons. Okay, so it's going to get really hot. This one here, we're not going to give that intense burst. It doesn't need to be intense because we could spread out the time. Okay, in diagnostic tubes we can't spread out the time because we because it's going to, the image is going to look blurred. 
We need to give an intense burst of diagnostic tubes. Okay, because we don't have image blurring, it's not an issue here. So we could spread out the time. So if we spread out the time, we could reduce the current. And if we reduce the current, then the anode will get as hot. Okay. And it, I mean it has some cooling fins, but it doesn't need to rotate. Okay. So think about that, all those factors that play in, in there and ask me questions if you want. Some terms, cathode. We already talked about the cathode. Cathode is the internal piece of metal, uh, internal metal piece that produces electrons. So it's usually in the form of a little spring. It looks like a little spring, like a light bulb. There's a little spring inside a light bulb. And uh, it's the source of electrons in an X-ray tube. The anode is uh, a metal piece, usually made out of uh, tungsten, that serves as an electron target. Okay, so the, the electrons uh, interact with that target, and it's usually made of tungsten. And W stands for Wolfram, it's a German word. So um, an anodes are usually made out of tungsten, they're high Z74, and they have a high heat conductivity. That's important, because they're very good at dissipating heat, so they won't, they won't soak up the heat. It has a high melting point, 3370 degrees Celsius. Um, milliamps, we talked about this, applied to the filament, so that's the current. Milli meaning 1,000th of an amp. Kilovoltage is the potential difference between the anode and the cathode, and that is what, what accelerates the electrons from the filament to the anode. Okay. S, usually you'll see MAS. S is the time that the X-rays are being produced, so how long the X-rays are turned on. And then Röntgen, besides being, besides being a German guy, is a unit of exposure. Okay. And we'll talk about exposure. Basically, exposure is a quantity of electric charge liberated in the air by radiation. Okay, and you'll see later on that exposure and dose are, are somewhat related, but they're not the same thing. So, again, exposure it stands for quantity of electric charge. How much electric charge is being relate, liberated in the air by, uh, by radiation? Okay, some more terms. Well, these are just some bullet points. The potential kilovoltage difference across the two pulls electrons out of the filament which contains a current, we'll talk about that. The anode can be made of tungsten. These are some other metals, rhodium or molybdenum. They all have high melting points. The anode needs to be made of a high atomic number material with good heat conduct, uh, conductivity properties. Um, let's see what, let's see what that. Why do you think it needs to be made of high Z? What's the deal with high Z? Well, it all has to do with the production of x ray Uh-huh. The highest you can use a greater force than the electron and the what they inside. Right. There's a higher probability of interaction between the electron and the material. Right. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit more detail. Uh, X-ray tubes are rated in heat units. And a heat unit is defined as the KVP times the MA times the time. And basically that's the heat units is if you take a shot, an X-ray, and you've got these settings, you set a KVP on the on the console, you set an MA and you deliver it for a certain time, you've developed, you've treated that, or you've, you've uh, irradiated with a certain number of heat units. A certain extra tube will only be able to um, function up to a certain maximum heat unit. Okay. Some extra tubes have higher heat units and some are not, not as good and they have high, uh, lower heat units. What is KVP? KVP? K peak? Oh, I didn't define KVP yet. Uh, K KVP I defined, right, it's kilovoltage, which is the potential difference against the, between the anode and the cathode. KVP is peak kilovoltage. And peak kilovoltage, the, the anode, uh, the voltage between the anode and the cathode, in its simplest form, is a sine wave. Okay. And the peak kilovoltage is the maximum voltage. So this would be, uh, this would be volts, or kilovolts. Okay, and this is time. So as you apply the KV, as you apply the KV across the tube, um, the, the voltage will be sinusoidal, but actually the voltage is, you'll see in your other course, the voltage is rectified, so it's actually pretty flat. But what KVP is, is the peak kilovoltage, so the maximum voltage, all right? Um, even, even after the newer tubes are, are, um, are rectified and the voltage stays pretty constant, but there's a little bit of ripple. So KVP is the peak, is the maximum voltage. Okay, uh, moving on. The X-ray tube is bathed in dielectric oil for cooling and insulation. Okay, oil, the oil serves those two purposes, it cools and it insulates. The tube housing holds the oil and contains lead for shielding. 
there's always a little bit of leakage radiation, a little bit of leakage photons, and so there's lead around a tube. If you open up a tube housing, you'll see lead in there. Um, and obviously you don't want stray radiation because people, uh, the patient's going to get it and uh, that's not desirable. We don't need to treat the patient with extra radiation. The maximum allowable leakage, the state has a, a limit of 100 milliruntgen per hour. You're going to see this, this unit a lot. Milliruntgen per hour at one meter from the tube. And this is a unit of exposure rate. Anytime you have per hour, per time, it's rate. And milliruntgen, we talked about before, is a unit of exposure. So at one meter from the tube, you're allowed one milliruntgen per hour. And if it has more, and usually when we buy a new unit, we test that. We have, we have instruments that test that can measure exposure, and we test that to make sure that the leakage is within allowable levels. Uh, a big part of our job is radiation safety, and that's one of the tests we do, among many, many. Diagnostic tubes have rotating anodes, while therapy tubes have stationary ones, and we talked about that already. Okay, more terms. Thermionic emission. So, thermionic emission is the emission of electrons from a heated filament that carries a current. That's basically what I talked about before. If you apply a current to, to a filament, there's thermionic emission, it's going gonna, it's gonna to emit um, electrons. Thermionic through, through temperature increase. Space charge effect. So the space charge effect, what this means is that there's not enough potential difference, so the KV is not high enough, between the anode and the cathode to pull electrons away from the filament. And space charges form around the filament. So you have a filament, which is our cathode, and we have an MAA traveling through the cathode. And, uh, and the anode is, the anode is over here, say, I turn, turn the tube on its side. And it's this way. Uh, and so these electrons that are boiling off here are just kind of sitting around because the KV between these, this is positive, this is neg and this is negative, is not enough. There's not enough of a potential difference to pull these guys from here to here. Okay? So there'll be this electron cloud kind of hovering around the filament. And you'll shoot. You, if you dial up a KV that's too low, you'll push the button, the x-ray button, Bink, and nothing will happen. You won't get an image. Okay. And actually, X-ray tubes today—they know what their limits are, and you'll get a little an error on the display. You know, it'll say something like a, uh, it'll say um, invalid technique. So space charge effect: space charges form around the filament. Then they don't—they don't get to the anode, therefore they can't make radiation. So what happens, like, if once the the KV is dialed back up, mm -hmm. does that cause a problem then, having that electron cloud, or does it all just? go back to, like, then those electrons move to the anode and you have a normal Yeah, it's not a problem. Emission. They'll just start, yeah. They'll okay. just start moving. And how similar is thermionic emission to like the light bulb? Is that the same thing? A thermionic emission? Yeah, but it's at a different energy. Um, so a light bulb, a light bulb fluoresces. Well, actually, and actually, they both fluoresce. They both, um, but a light bulb fluoresces due to, um, due to excitations within the metal. Get up and down, these electrons are moving up and down within the atom. And that creates light. That creates um, well, that creates light. With the X-ray tube, the, it's pretty much the same thing. But it'll glow red. You know, let's see. What's an example of something that you can see? You see glow red. The film. The film turns red just from heat. Okay. And there is a little bit of uh, visual. You know, a, it emits a little bit of light, but it's not made to produce light, so it doesn't make a lot of light. So, but it's uh, it's pretty similar. But the materials are different, so. It doesn't create the same, the same light. Okay, so another term is saturation. And saturation occurs uh, for maximum tube current. It's limited by insufficient current flowing through the film. So this is the opposite effect. So now, now you've, dialed in, you've dialed in too much KV. So in saturation, there's a lot of KV. And there aren't enough electrons out here to create an image. So there's not an FMA. So in saturation, um, you've you've got a, you've, so you do have two current. There is some current. Okay, so there's MA, there's filament current, and there is two current. So you're creating uh, you're creating electrons and you're creating X-rays. But as you increase your KV, when you get to saturation, as you increase your KV, you no longer get any more current, any more tube current. And the reason you don't get any more tube current, because you're pulling out as many electrons 
as you have available in your film. Okay? So your image will not get any darker. Normally, as you increase KB or you increase MA, it's going to make your image darker because you're producing more x-rays. So saturation occurs when, the two, when you're increasing your tube current, but you're not getting any more x-rays. Uh, you need to get, to get more x-rays, you need to increase your MA to increase your supply of electrons. Okay? Once you increase your supply of electrons, then your tube current will increase, your image will get darker. Okay? So saturation occurs for too high a KV for the particular MA that you're using. Okay? Secondary emission, high energy electrons. We already talked about this when, when we talked about the uh, Therapy two, high energy electrons that are created in the anode. They can contribute to a charge buildup in the tube housing, which can create an electric field that distorts the extra field. Difficult to achieve a sharp field edge, which is a penumbra, and I'll explain penumbra. So again, that happens. You get a filament, an anode. These electrons have an energy that moves them, or have a force that pushes them over. They interact with electrons. So there's a bunch of atoms in the anode, the at and the atoms have electrons. And these electrons um, are knocked out of their orbitals from the primary. So these are secondary. These are primary. These knock these out of their orbitals, and they fly out into the tube housing, and, um, and they collect on the tube housing. And they create an electric field that disrupts this electric field. Okay, so there's an electric field here, it moves in this direction, and they disrupt this electric field. And the pro what, what ends up happening is that the the penumbra, well let's talk let's talk about penumbra. I have a better slide for penumbra. I'll describe it in a minute. It affects the penumbra. Okay, Larmor relationship. So the Larmor relationship is this quote. Any time a charged particle is accelerated or decelerated, it emits part of its kinetic energy in the form of Bremsstrahlung photons. So any time a charged particle, be it an electron or a proton or an alpha particle, any of those particles, any time they're accelerated or decelerated, they emit part of their kinetic energy as Bremsstrahlung photons. Okay. And we'll talk about Bremsstrahlung next. So Bremsstrahlung. German word. Bremsstrahlung means... The electron gives up the energy during its slowing down near the nucleus and it's given off as an X-ray. So Bremsstrahlung means breaking radiation. It's the, air, it's the radiation that's given off as the electron slows down. Okay. And the electron will give off its energy as a radiated loss because it's giving off radiation. It's giving off X-rays. In other words, it, it, can, give, it can give up its energy in many different uh, processes, but the radiated loss is the Brem, is Bremsstrahlung. Uh, okay, so let's just draw a quick picture of what that looks like. All right, so now I'm going to take the anode and I'm going to blow up the anode down to the atomic, the atomic level. So here's here's the nucleus, and that's that's the nucleus of tungsten, and there are electrons up here in the in the um, in the orbitals. So here comes this electron from the filament travels towards the nucleus, which is positively charged. Uh, and if it, um, so this, this can get, so usually it doesn't hit head on, it can hit head on, but most of the interactions are with, when the electron travels at it in the vicinity because all material, material looks solid, but it's really mostly empty between. Is that okay? Sorry. Did you I, crash? Yeah, I crashed. I'm still listening. <laughs> All right, so the electron travels in the, you know, like, again, like I was saying, most materials, it feels solid, but it's really empty space. There's a lot of empty space in material because most of, as we talked about last time, material, most of, the, most of the mass is concentrated in the nucleus, and there's just a whole bunch of empty space between nuclei. So the electrons travel between that empty space, and they experience electrostatic forces. So this negatively charged electron experiences the, the pull of this positively charged nucleus, and as it does that, it's kind of like a planet. It does this little orbital around it. Okay, it experiences a pull. And as it does that, it's going to lose some energy. 
and it loses the energy, not in, not in the form of sound, not in the form of heat, although there, it can lose energy and heat, but when we're talking about this process, this is Brumstrollum, Took me years to know how to spell it right. Uh, Bremstrahlen, it'll, it'll emit X rays as it does that. That's how it gives up its energy. It gives, it gives up its energy in the form of X rays. These are not character. Remember characteristic X rays between the between the orbitals. These are not characteristic X rays. These are different kind of X rays. They look the same. If you just if you were looking at the X rays, they look the same. But the difference between characteristic X rays and these X rays. Characteristic are particular to the atom. A certain atom will have certain certain X-rays, and other atoms will have certain other characteristic X-rays. This is called white radiation. It can happen in a spectrum. It can be from zero, uh, an energy of zero, to an end, to the maximum energy of this electron. Okay. So remember this: the maximum energy of this X-ray is the energy of this electron. Uh, and Say the KVP. Can you say it can be from zero to the maximum? Yeah, from zero to the Because the uh, electron can give up all of its energy to brush off. That's not the maximum energy. The maximum energy of the X ray. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I might have reversed it. The, maximum, the, energy's maximum, the maximum energy of the X ray will be the electron's energy. Yeah. Uh, so say the KVP is 100 K. 100 kV, what's the maximum energy of the X-ray? So kVp is the potential difference between the cathode and the anode. The electron acquires that energy as it, as it moves across to the anode. It can achieve 100 kEV. And so it can achieve 100 kEV. And so the, the maximum energy of the X-ray is going to be 100 kV. Okay. okay. Uh, so the second bullet. New photon, this one right here, has a maximum energy of the incident electron's energy. Okay. And this is called radiative energy loss. We're, radi we're creating radiation. This interaction results in a spectrum of X-ray energies, as I, as I said. Uh, energy loss through electron-electron collisions, that's a different kind of energy loss. So that's the energy loss when the electron interacts with another with an orbital electron. If this electron interacts with an orbital electron and then either produces excitation or um, ionization. So one or the other. These, these will both create heat. Okay, when an electron and an electron interact. Okay. Uh, so energy loss through electron, electron collisions uh, create heat. So there's two types of energy losses. Electron-electron energy loss and electron nuclear energy loss. And this is radiative and this is called collisional. Okay, so radiative energy loss divided by collisional energy loss, I'm on this bullet right here. Radiative energy loss divided by collisional energy loss, do I have a mouse here? Yeah. Uh, equals E sub K times the atomic number divided by 820. And E sub K is the kinetic energy of the electron and MeV. All right, so if we want to get an idea of how, how the energy of the electrons is being um, um, lost, so it's being transferred to the anode. We can look at this. We can look at this ratio. Okay, so let's let's do an example. So for for tungsten, Z is seventy four. The question is, what percentage goes into creating X rays in tungsten for one hundred keV electron? What percent is into creating X rays? Okay, so we're talking about X rays. We're talking about the the radiative energy loss goes into tungsten for one hundred keV electron. We'll just plug it into the equation. Uh, 100 keV, that goes into the E sub K, but we've got to put it in units of MeV, so it's 0 0.1 times Z, Z is 74, so that's 7.4 divided by 820, and what is that? It's 0.1 times 7. What is that number? It's a pretty small number. I think it's 0 0.009. So it's 
So it's 0 0.1 uh, MeV times 74 over 820 equals, it's around 0 0.009, okay? So that means that the radiative energy loss is about a percent compared to, yeah, 0 0.9. In this case, it's about a percent compared to the collisional loss. Okay, what that also says is that, but that, did I divide that way? I think I did. What that also says is that to create x-rays, the energy in the x-rays is about 1% of the total energy that this tube is creating. So an x-ray tube is a very inefficient device in terms of energy transfer, in terms of how much energy you put in and how much energy you put out. You put in a lot of energy, but you don't get out a lot. Okay, it's mostly, it mostly goes to heat. Okay. So this will depend on the, the atomic number. Okay, probability of Bremsstrahlung. What's the probability of Bremsstrahlung production? Uh, Bremsstrahlung production is proportional to Z, the atomic number squared. Okay, so as your atomic number goes up, there's going to be more Bremsstrahlung. All right, so here's a graph. Uh, this is a very simple graph of a, a, um, a spectrum, an energy spectrum. And uh, let's, uh, let's explain this a little bit. This is a 60 kVp energy spectrum, and this is a 100 kVp energy spectrum. I've got two of them here. Uh, the y-axis is relative intensity, so how many photons? This is just number of photons. And the x-axis is photon energy, and the photon energy that's coming out, and that's this energy. It's the energy of the x-rays that are being emitted. And this is just radiative. We're not looking at collisional right now. Okay? This is just radiative, a radiative spectrum. So what we're seeing, for a 100, K, for 100 kVp beam, and we have the filtered and unfiltered. Now, the filtered and unfiltered means if you're able to create an x-ray tube without a, a house, with no glass and no filter or anything there, you'd get a spectrum that looks like the straight line, you know, with photons. So what this means, and let's look at the unfiltered case first. What this means is that if you've got 100 kVp applied to your tube, you're going to have very a very small amount of... Um, a very small amount of 100 keV photons, okay? Because, and then if you apply, if you apply, um, but you're going to have a very large amount of low energy photons, okay? Because these, these high energy photons will interact, well, or the, sorry, the electrons will interact once, and then they'll keep interacting, and they'll create lower energy photons. So these photons will produce, sorry, these electrons that, that are 100 keV will create the 100 keV photons, but they'll also create a lot of low energy photons, okay, down here. So all those will add up, and what happens is that you end, up, you end up with a spectrum where there's a lot of low energy photons being created and very little high energy photons created. Now, the filter case means that as soon as you put a piece of glass in there, as soon as you put an envelope around it, you're filtering out the low energy photons. Okay? Low energy photons, again, are less penetrating. Just think of low energy photons as photons that interact readily. They interact right away with something. The higher energy photons have a lower probability of interaction. They don't interact as, as readily so they can get through easily. Okay? So, uh, so the low energy photons will get filtered out and you get a spectrum that looks like this. And the 60 kVp, of course, if you're only applying 60 kVp across the tube, you can't get any more than 60 kV photons. Right? So that's the maximum number right here. And this is this is just completely theoretical, this line, because it doesn't happen. You always have a glass tube and you always have filters. This is more realistic here. And this is just the equation of this line. Okay, so this is something that we never use, but um, it's a theoretical equation. K is a constant, Z is the atomic number of the target. And E sub m is the maximum photon energy, and E is the photon energy. Okay, we're going to look at a few more spectrums here. Spectra. Electron uh, classical radiation. Yeah, sorry, characteristic radiation. Mm. We talked about this last class, remember? Quick review. Characteristic radiation.
Okay, characters of radiation. You've got a nucleus, orbital electron here, and the K shell. K shell is that the that's the closest shell, right? K shell, and then the L shell is up here. Um, binding energy of the K shell is say 88 keV, and the binding energy of the L shell is um, I don't know, say 12 keV. What's a possible energy of a characteristic photon? 76. Yeah, 76. It would be the difference. So if I'm if I'm able to create a hole, if I create a hole in the K shell, then an electron from the L shell may drop into the hole, and the energy of the characteristic radiation is just simply the 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 difference between the two binding energies. Okay. So this characteristic photon will have 76 keV. I'm interested. That makes sense. And that's characteristic, not Bremschall. Looks the same. And that is the maximum. Sorry? The maximum. This is the maximum? I mean the maximum energy. It can have. It's the only energy it can have. Yeah. But the maximum energy for this atom, maximum characteristic energy for this atom, is not 76. What do you think the maximum energy is? I mean, we don't have numbers, but. How can you get more energy than, how can you get a higher characteristic energy than 76? Um, yeah. If you've got an electron up in the N, yeah. and he drops all the way down to K, and say the binding energy of N is 3 keV, so now you've got 88 minus 3, this guy's going to have 85. Yeah, but how do you control that? It's just, what do you mean? Oh, how do you That's just it? natural. Yeah, but how can you, can you choose, I mean... Oh, how, do you, how does it L's decide to... Okay. No, that's a random oh, process. Okay. So it, it actually, there's certain ones that happen more, more often than others. Okay, and I'll show you, I have a table that shows you which one happens. Yeah. Okay, so if the binding energy of the electron is B1, okay, we just talked about that. All right, here's a, here's a more realistic spectrum. There's a lot of lines on there. The difference between each of those curves is just the KVP that I've applied across the tube. Okay. So the X-ray tube has, I can apply 60, I can apply 80, 100, or I can apply 119 KVP. So each curve has a different spectrum. And so if I apply a really low KVP, I'll have just a few photons, X-ray photons at 60 KVP, and I'll have a whole bunch at 35 KVP. Okay. If I apply an 80 KVP across my tube, I'll have a whole bunch. Usually the rule of thumb is a third kV. In other words, rule of thumb being the most probable energy that comes out of the X-ray tube is a third of your kVp. So if you dial 80 kVp on your tube, a third of that is the most common energy, full-time energy. Okay? Now look at what happens as I start increasing my kV. Let's go all the way to 120. Look at this. You've got k beta and a k alpha. Those are characteristic lines. Okay? So by applying a potential difference across my tube, this is my filament, here's my anode, okay, and then the electrons interact with, an, here's a nucleus, okay, and the electrons interact and they create bremsstrahlung, but they also do this stuff, okay, because the electrons are interacting with electrons in the orbitals, okay, and once, once the electron energy reaches the binding energy of the orbital, we said, let's say the binding energy is 88 kV, keV. Okay, well, what's this material? This is tungsten. The binding energy of tungsten is, uh, is 88. So once, once you hit 88, is it 88? Okay, I'll, we'll check, it's on the next slide. But once, once the electron energy reaches, look at this little peak right here. Once the electron energy reaches the binding energy, 69, looks like 69, reaches the binding energy of that shell, then that electron has enough energy to boot this guy out of the K shell, and he creates a hole. Once you've created a hole, then you can start creating uh, characteristic X-rays, okay? Now, that's for the K shell. What about, what about these shells out here? So, so let's say this is the binding energy of the L shell. This is just hypothetical, 12 keV. Binding energy is 12 keV. You don't need much energy. I mean, you've got, even at 60 keVp, You've got 12 keV electrons, so you're actually creating holes in these, but the intensity is not very high, so you're not seeing these peaks. The intensity is not high enough 
of the characteristic x-rays for the L shell, intensity is not high enough, so you, those, you're creating characteristic x-rays all the time, not necessarily in the K shell, but up in the lower energy shells, but the intensity is not as high, so you're not seeing those peaks in here. Okay? The reason you're seeing these peaks is because what we call the cross-section of the probability of an electron interacting with another electron is very high in the K shell. Okay, so you're creating a whole bunch of these K-shell uh, photons, characteristic photons. Okay, and then this graph also shows continuous white radiation is this continuous spectrum, and the um, characteristic is obviously the peaks for tungsten. There's K-alpha and K-beta, and I'll explain what the difference is here. Higher energy, obviously the K, okay, let's go back one sec. The K-beta is of a higher energy, right? So the characteristic photons from K-beta have a bit of a higher energy than the K-alphas. Uh, let's see why that is. Here's a table from John Tenkanyam. Did you go by John Tenkanyam yet? No. Oh, okay, that's in your next, next quarter. So here's a table out of John Tenkanyam. John Tenkanyam, known as the Bible of medical physics. It was written many, many years ago. And it's, it's a good book. Anyway, getting back to tungsten. K lines of tungsten. What's a K line? What do you think of K line? Yeah, it's anything, anything that creates, anytime you get a characteristic photon that drops produced by an electron that drops down to the K-shell, okay? That's a K-line. But, and, the, and we saw that there can be several. We, could, we saw that there's electrons dropping from L to K, you can create photons that way, M to K, and also subshells. So L has more than one shell. It has, uh, at least in this table, there's at least two. There's L3 and now there's L2. So within L, you got L3 and L2. Within M, you've got M1, M2. There's no K1 and K2, so you've got L, 2, L, 3, and then M has M, and then there's a whole bunch of subshells in M, and M and N as well. So it looks like this has at least five subshells for a tungsten, and N has, you've got five subshells here. So, so let's look at what these mean. So K, N3. So anything that goes from N3 to N3 or N2 to K will be a K beta line and it'll create a uh, characteristic photon of energy of 69 keV. But there's only seven of those, relative seven, seven of those. Then the ones that go from M3 subshell to K is K beta 2, energy of 67, which is 21, a little few more of those. Then M2 to K, 66. These are all pretty similar in energy. There's 11 of them. The most common are right here. 100 is the most common. So the L3 to K transition is the most common at 59 keV. And then here's, these are K-alphas. And the difference between betas and the alphas are where they originate. The alphas come from L and betas come from N, or N, N or N. Okay, that's tungsten, here's molybdenum. Same idea. But look at the difference in energy between K-lines in Molly and the K-lines in tungsten. Um, big difference between tungsten and Molly, tungsten's atomic number is higher than Molly. And molybdenum. So the, uh, I mean, the most common is going to be the this, yeah, the most common is going to be this one right here. Yep. Okay, and that's that big spike that you saw, that K alpha. But the energy is lower in this one compared to that one. So more common, there's going to be more of these, but the energy is lower than these. And the energy is lower because they originate in a closer shell. The electrons originate they're in the neighboring shell. These are one shell up, N is one shell up. Okay. And these are just some, these are L lines of tungsten. So these are from N to L. So these are electrons that drop from N down to L. They don't make it all the way to K. And obviously, the difference in binding energies is smaller, therefore the characteristic photon energy is going to be smaller. And so these are all little numbers over here. Okay? Now those, those peaks don't show up, again, those peaks don't show up in this curve because they're all in here. So the Bremsstrahlung takes over. There's a lot more Bremsstrahlung than there are of these guys. So you don't see those peaks. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. And I've talked about all those points. Okay. Uh, X-ray absorption energy. So absorption energy is just the binding energy that we keep talking about. This is another table from Johns and Cunningham, and this table just shows um, the binding energies of certain K, L, and M shells for different materials. So we've got oxygen, calcium, copper, moly, tin, tungsten, and lead. There's a atomic number for tungsten. There's the atomic number for lead. There's the K-shell, that's 69 that we saw. Remember that in the, in the spectrum, there was a little spike at 69? That's what that is. 
And then these are the, basically this is the table of binding energies for the different materials. So a characteristic X-ray photon energy equals the difference of absorption energies between shells. We talked about that. If the electron is not energetic enough to knock out an orbital electron, the lines don't appear. Okay. Oh, this is just a little review. Why would long exposure times be undesirable when using diagnostic x-ray tubes? It's a high, high energy. Mm -hmm. Patient movement. Patient movement. Yeah. Oh. So long exposure times and di remember diagnostic tubes are the ones that uh, diagnostic tubes are the ones that are making images, right? We're not we're not using therapy, we're making images. So if you have a long exposure time, basically if you're doing a chest x-ray, the patient's gonna breathe, right? So you're gonna see breathing blur. Okay. Why do diagnostic tubes have rotating atoms? To dissipate the heat. Okay. Why don't therapy tubes have rotating atoms? It's longer exposure time. We can use a longer exposure time and dissipate the heat through time. Why are hooded anodes on a therapy tube made of medium Z material like copper internally and a high Z material tungsten externally? Copper's first attenuation of the electrons. Which electrons? Speed secondary, secondary electrons. Right. And then the tungsten attenuates the photons that come off of those interactions. Right. Okay. What is the advantage of added filtration? Mm -hmm. To filter out low energy photons. And what's wrong with low energy photons? They just kill patients. Well, that's a little extreme. <laughs> but... <laughs> no, it, it's, yeah. it's useless. It doesn't give. Any benefits to the picture, it just exposes the patient. Right. Operation. It doesn't contribute to the image, correct. Okay. A little animation there. Okay. Uh, another example a 90 keV electron interacts with a tungsten target. Okay. If I have my x ray tube set to 80 kVp, can I get a 90 keV electron? No, impossible. If I have it set to Mm, uh, 120 kVp. Can I have a 90 kV electron? Most of them are going to be pretty much 120 kV. Most of them achieve this, but there could be some that are not 90 kV. Anyway, so most, so usually, I'm probably, I'm probably going to get 90 kV electrons if I set it to 90 kVp. So it interacts with the target. 30 kV Bremsstrahlung photon is emitted, which then goes on to eject an orbital electron. Which would be the possible characteristic X-ray lines visible after this last interaction? Okay, so 90 kV Bremsstrahlung. Sorry, 30 kV Bremsstrahlung. We know that that's possible, right? If you have a, a 90 kV kV electron, uh, here's a nucleus and um, 90 kV electron. 90 kV electron interacts with the nucleus, and we know that this. The, the emission of this x-ray will, it's continuous. It can be from 0 to 90. Right? So we know that we can get a, a 30 keV photon. There's a 30 keV photon. Now that guy interacts with an orbital electron. Okay, and it knocks the electron out. Now what material are we talking about? Tungsten, okay. First of all, can it not? Can this knock out an electron in tungsten, an orbital electron? Can it even do it? Of course it can. Okay, it can't knock out the can't knock out this one, but it can knock out all these. Right. So if it does do that, which would be the possible characteristic X-ray lines visible after this? So what X-ray lines would you see? Yeah, you, you can see a whole bunch of these. Since you can knock out any of these, and uh, you, uh, there's no end here, but you could probably see, any, you know, you, you can knock out the 12, so these could drop into the 12, and you get a, a, around you know, 10 keV characteristic photon after that interaction, or the ends could drop into these. So you could get a variety, but you would not get a K-shell. You would not get a K-line, okay? All right. Uh, some, some practical things. Radiation source size. So, the, so we've got a couple of pictures there of anodes, of X-ray tube anodes, and the the size of the 
the size of the interaction point between the electrons and the anode is very important because that determines how sharp your image is going to be. If that interaction point is big, your image is going to be blurry. If it's small, it's going to be a sharp image, and I'll explain what that is. But here's a, here's a schematic. Here's a, an anode and a filament. This is where the MA runs, right? And then the KB is the potential difference across these two. So the electrons travel from here to here, interact here, and the actual focal spot is defined as the interaction point uh, where they interact in the focal spot. Now, if, you tr if we turn this, see how the focal spot's at an angle? If we place the patient down here, and we place the film behind the patient, the effective focal spot looks small. Look at the projection, and that's good. You want a really small focal spot to create a small, to create a sharp image. Now, the effective focal spot is defined as little a, which equals big A, times sine theta. Okay, and theta is the same angle, is the angle of the focal spot. Now, if you look through the specs of an X-ray tube, you'll see things like uh, you'll see things like uh, anode tube angle, which is very important in mammography, where you want really, really sharp images because you're looking at very small uh, structures. You have a very small theta. That tube angle is almost vertical because you want a very small focal spot. Uh, the effective focal spot size increases as you go from this point to this point. Okay? Because this, this gets wider as you go as you go from here to here. So objects in this area will appear sharper than objects in this area. Okay, and this picture right here shows how you do um, how you can take a picture of the actual focal spot on the on the anode. This is called a pinhole camera. So it's, it's made with a lead plate and a really, really tiny hole. And they uh, turn on the anode, and then they expose the film. And you can see a picture of the, and the next slide shows it. You can see a picture of the focal spot. So they call that the double banana, because there's, this looks like there's a banana here and a banana here, which is where the electrons interact on the anode. Okay, so this is, this is the anode that we keep talking about. And if you turn it, it looks like a square. And so the electrons interact basically in two spots. And they um, and then it's blue, and there's some there's some interaction here, but not as much. But they're the two bananas are here. Okay, so they interact they interact in two spots, and then this is an overexposed pinhole camera of the focal spot. Okay, beam penumbra. And we talked a few slides ago. I talked about beam penumbra. And I said I'm not going to talk about it because this is a better slide. So beam penumbra. The penumbra is the zone between the inside the field and outside the field. It's the penumbra. It's in between. It's not, and, and this is a schematic of, the, of, a, of an x-ray uh, tube with a source. And uh, the source is up here. With this source could be, could be the anode. And this would be where the patient is. And this would be where, where the piece of film is. Um, and the penumbra is the area between what we, where the radiation is and the outside, there's no radiation. So there's this area here called the penumbra. And the penumbra changes in size depending on a few things. Number one, the SSD, which is the source to, uh, source to surface distance. Okay. The surface in this, in this case could be a piece of film. The SDD, source to diaphragm distance. And the diaphragm is the collimator. That's the thing that defines the size of the field. Okay. And then it also depends on the source size. Remember how I said the smaller the source, the sharper the image is going to be? So that, that defines the penumbra. So you guys have to know this equation. Penumbra is equal to source size times the difference between uh, SSD and SDD divided by SDD. So as we increase the source size, we're going to increase the penumbra. That's bad. Our images are going to get blurry. If we, let's see, if we increase the SDD, if we increase the source to diaphragm distance, that's going to make the penumbra smaller. So if we, make the, if we place the diaphragm really close to the patient, or the collimator really close to the patient, it's going to make the penumbra smaller. So that's somewhat important when you're, say, you remember that therapy tube that we were talking about? So the anode's up here, and the filament's up here. We're creating x-rays, and then there's the collimator. Down here. Okay, and we can def we can define the column area, and the patient's patient is here, and the tumor's over here. Now, if this collimator is up up near the X-ray source, 
the patient's going to experience, there's going to be a large penumbra. Okay? So the penumbra is going to be large, which means that the, the x-ray field, even though, even though we think it's, usually there's a light inside these units, and you can turn on the light, and you can see the light projected on the patient. Even though you see this light projected, and it looks like it's being defined like this, well, there's actually, the field is actually, um, it goes from a high point here to a low point, but it's gradual. I thought the penumbra is big. Okay, and that's not good, because you want, when you want to treat a tumor, you want to know, I want to treat this much, and I want the radiation to stop at this point. So you want a sharp penumbra. You want the dose to go from really high to really, to nothing in a very short time. If your penumbra is larger, you're going to have this gradual blurring out, which is not desirable. So one way to, one way to make the penumbra sharper is we could put lead right on the patient's surface. We could put lead right here. And by putting lead right on the patient's surface, we've got a really sharp penumbra. And we know that where the lead ends, that's where the radiation ends. Or where it starts, that's where the radiation starts. Okay? And now what we've done by doing that is we've, we have uh, increased our SDD by doing that. Okay? And that's how we can make a sharp penumbra. Okay, um, and in terms of imaging, so that's treatment. And in terms of imaging, here's a source. Again, I'm going to draw kind of like that picture up there. Here's a source. And say we're imaging a, a femur. There's the femur. And we want to know, and there's a film down here. So the femur's here, film's here. So the x-rays are going to come from the source. Um, just imagine that anode, that's an anode. If the source is large, the x-rays can be emitted at this point. It can be emitted here, 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 here. The x-rays can be emitted from different places. Okay, so say the x-rays are emitted from this point. So they'll hit. I want to look at the edge of this, the, the femur right here. I want to see where that ends up on the film. So the x-rays that are emitted here will project down here. The x-rays that are emitted at this point will project here. So the edge of this femur will be blurred out. It'll look like that. And it'll be a big blurry, blurred area, which, is, which represents the edge of the femur. If we make our source a point, if it's small, we redraw our femur. Do it. Redraw our femur. Now this, the X-rays can only come from one spot. Okay, so the X-rays originate here. They interact with the edge, and the edge of the femur looks like a line. Looks like an edge. A lot sharper than this. This would be a blurred-out edge. Okay. So that shows the advantage of having a small source versus a large. This is called geometric penumbra, by the way. So this is geometric. And so is that. That's the geometric penumbra. There's also the dosimetric penumbra that we'll get into later on. Okay, so this is a this is a plot of the angular distribution of x-rays. Um, and okay, so let's let's think about what that means. The I keep showing the anode like this, okay, and the electrons move from here to here, and they interact. Well, which way are the photons going to go? Which way are they going to go? Are they going to go straight through? Are they going to, when they when there's Bremsstrahlung, which way, what direction does Bremsstrahlung take? Well, as it turns out, the direction that the Bremsstrahlung is emitted is energy dependent. And it's dependent on the energy of the electron. Okay, so the electron of the ener the energy of the electron interacting with the metal. So it depends. Well, it depends on the metal too. It depends on the anode material and it depends on the energy. But this graph right here shows that for this graph right here is a 30 kV with aluminum foil. So 30 kV um, electrons interacting with aluminum. As the electrons come in and they interact with the aluminum at this point here, the most probable angle is 60 degrees, right here. Okay? You're not going to have too many photons, Bremsstrahlung photons emitting in this direction. You're going to have some emitting in the forward direction, but not that many. So the amount of photons that get emitted is the size of the arrow. Okay? So the, this is the biggest arrow right here. So most of the photons of a 30 kV aluminum foil interacting with uh, uh, 30 kV electrons interacting with aluminum foil is in the 60 degrees, 70 degrees, 50 degrees. Okay? 
It's not, it's not in the forward direction. As you're in, and I don't have a graph, I wish I had a graph of um, like 100, 100 keV electrons interacting in tungsten, because that's more practical, that's what we've been, but I, I don't have that graph. So just, but what happens is as the, energy, as the Z gets higher, so if we go to tungsten, these will be more 90 degrees. They'll be more emitted in this direction. Okay? And if you go really high energies, like 10 MeV, like for linear accelerators, the electron beam hits the target, and then most of the photons are in the forward direction. Okay, so as your energy gets higher, the, pho the Bremsstrahlung photons will start to go forward. Okay, as the energy gets lower, they'll be emitted at 90 degrees, not too much in the backward direction. So that's why when I, keep, when I show this, I always show the photons being emitted in this direction, and they actually, uh, let's see, 90 degrees to this, they're actually more like, yeah, I mean, most of them are emitted in, in this direction. And the, the angle of the anode is constructed so that when you mount the tube, most of the radiation will end up at 90 degrees to the tube. And that's how these are, are constructed and mounted. Okay, another example. 68 keV electrons lose energy in a tungsten target via what? And that, so you've got to rank these in terms of uh, probability. What's the highest probability? What's the lowest? Highest probability. What is the most? So the three choices are production of characteristic X-rays. We talked about that. Production of Bremsstrahlung, um, and then heat loss. I'll go with D. You're going to go with D, okay? D. So you're saying B is the most common. So then, then heat loss, then characteristic. Everybody agree? No. I think okay. E. Okay. Okay. Highest probability to lowest probability. Yeah. So highest to lowest. Uh, I think it's either A or C. A or C. Uh, probably C. Okay. Remember, a few slides ago, we calculated the the ratio of radiate, radiative energy loss to collision line energy loss, and we said that the X-ray tube produces about one percent in, in radiation and ninety-nine percent heat. Okay. So heat loss is the the most common way that it's gonna that energy is gonna lose, that electrons are gonna lose energy okay, through heat loss. That is the most common. Next, characteristic of Bremschel. Bremschel. There's a whole bunch of Bremschel going on, and uh, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of Bremschel going on. And then, lastly, is characteristic X-rays. And when we image a patient, do you think which which of these two do you think we're using to image the patient? X-rays. Yeah, which one of these two X-rays? So these are X-rays, and these are X-rays. Which one of those two are we using to image the patient? It depends. It depends what we're imaging. If it's mammography, we use this. If it's everything else, we use Bremschel. In mammography, we use a we use a tungsten target with a specialized filter and uh, and the K edge. Of, uh, sorry, take it back. We use a molybdenum target or a rhodium target, and there's a very high K edge for molybdenum. Okay, so the characteristic X-rays are very numerous compared to Bremsstrahlung. So in mammography, we're actually using characteristic X-rays to image the patient. And uh, we're using Bremsstrahlung in any, every other modality. So I was a little bit confused, but if I'm on the right track, yeah. so X-rays I use just for imaging, but now photon is used for treatment? X-rays and photons are the same thing. But X-rays is a more spe it's more specific. So X-rays are high energy photons. Photons can be light, right? Photons can be anything. Photons can be photon is just a quanta of, of uh, energy from the electromagnetic spectrum. So it could be infrared, it could be light, it could be heat, it can be heat photons. Uh, but X-rays are high energy photons. Okay, are photons that are capable of penetrating material, solid material. So, X-rays that I pretty much use for imaging and the gamma rays are used for treatment? Gamma rays are used for treatment, and X-rays are used for imaging, you're correct. Um, although some gamma rays are used for imaging, you'll learn that in nuclear medicine. But for right now, X-rays are mostly used for imaging, but X-rays are also used for treatment. Remember that therapy tube that we talked about? Those X-rays are used for, for therapy. Okay. 
Because x-rays can go through a patient and get and stop in the bone and not stop in the air, and that produces an image. The difference between whether they're attenuated or not is what gives you an image. But x-rays also enter the patient and deposit energy in the patient. That energy can kill cells, cancer cells. So that's the, that's the therapy side of the x-rays. So between x-ray and gamma rays, which one are more energetic? Well, traditionally people think that gamma rays are more energetic because usually when you talk about gamma rays, they're pretty high energy already. And some x-rays are low energy, but you can have x-rays that are higher energy than gamma rays. Okay. So traditionally, gamma rays are high energy, but like in radiation therapy, our x-rays are higher energy than, than most gamma rays. Okay. So we can produce x-rays that are higher energy than gamma rays. And gamma rays come from radioactive material. Think of, you, you know that gamma rays only come from the nucleus, uh, right? And x-rays can come from uh, Bremsstrahlung or characteristic x-rays. Okay, they're, they're, they're both photons. They're all photons, but they come from different places. Okay. Um, okay, energy of characteristic radiation depends on energy of incident electron, atomic number of target, filament current, tube current. Energy of characteristic radiation. Okay, characteristic radiation again is? The radiation emitted when the electron drops above. Right. And, shows and we're talking about x rays, we're talking about photons, right? So the energy of those x rays and photons that come from uh, the, the change in the, the jump from an electron from one uh, suborbital to another depends on what? So let's just start at the bottom, two current, or let's start at the top. Energy of, energy of incident electron. So if an electron comes in and interacts with the anode, does, that, does the characteristic x-ray that, that gets produced, or possibly gets produced, does that depend on the energy of the electron? Yeah. No. Yeah, not really. It probably doesn't. In... Well, it might preclude some energies because if it's not energetic enough, it can't knock electrons out of certain orbits. Okay, so you might not see all the characteristic X-rays if it doesn't have enough energy. Okay, atomic number of target. Does the characteristic energy of the characteristic photons depend on the Z? Well, what is the energy? What is the energy of characteristic photons depend on? Right. And that difference between binding energies depends on the atom that we're talking about. Yeah. Okay, so it definitely depends on atomic number of target. Okay, filament current, does it depend on the current? So when you think of filament current, don't think of energy, think of quantity. Okay, so when we talk about MA and filament current, we're talking about intensity, quantity, numbers, lots, little. Okay, we're not talking about energy. Okay, so as you turn up the filament, you're creating, producing more electrons. Not higher energy, just more of them, okay? So if we're increasing the filament current, does that change the energy of the characteristic air? No, it doesn't, because it's just, we're just creating more of them, okay? What about tube current? Now what is tube current from the early slides? Right, per second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's charge per second, really. Uh, current is charge per second. So if we increase the tube current, does that change the energy of characteristic radiation? Again, it's just quantity. We're just increasing quantity. Okay. Does that all make sense, Mikhail? Mm -hmm. okay. Would you take a quick break? Yeah, 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 sure. What time is it? Um, it's okay. Yep. Let's take I a break. this whole lot of water sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no problem. That's a lot of material, too. Let me pause this so it doesn't become a big file. Recent memories of okay. All right, so that's so the, the first part of this lecture was diagn the diagnostic world, and we're going to get into the therapy world now. And um, radiation therapy. 
of course, we did talk a little bit about radiation therapy with the X-ray tube, but this is high-energy radiation therapy because with the X-ray tube therapy, you can only go so deep, and like you said, we can only treat superficial skin lesions. But of course, tumors grow deeper, so we need to we need to address the deeper tumors with higher energy beams. And the first uh, the first high energy beams were, were uh, came from a cobalt, and cobalt is a uh, cobalt sixty rather. Cobalt sixty is this this rod right here. Cobalt-60 is a radionuclide that's produced from cobalt-59. And it, uh, uh, let's see, cobalt-59, and it has, uh, let's see, it has an extra neutron. Yeah, it has an extra neutron, so it emits beta. It's through beta decay. So there's beta decay, and there's two, uh, there's two betas that get emitted, and then there's, from those betas, uh, it emits two gammas. And the two gammas are 1.17 MeV and 1.28 MeV, I believe. So we call the effective energy of a cobalt unit 1.25 MeV photons. And so this is, and this cobalt unit looks like, um, or actually looks like today's linear accelerators. It's mounted on a gantry. So this whole structure rotates 360 degrees around this, this black dot can be considered the axis. It rotates around the axis. So we could come in, so we could direct the beams from different angles. The cobalt itself lives up in the head of the machine up here. And uh, when we want to when we want to treat the patient, the cobalt the cobalt radiated nuclei is pushed out, and it comes through this part right here. When we don't want to treat, we want to be uh, we want to stop stop the radiation. It gets pulled in, and it takes energy to push it out. So that if the power goes out, it just gets sucked back in. If the power goes out, and if it gets stuck, there's a little you don't see it, but there's a little port up here. If the source gets stuck. Uh, we had emergency procedures that we would follow. We'd come in the room, we rotate this head in that direction so the beam would point over there, and there was this rod that was stuck in there. And we, and I've never done it, but there was, <laughs> there was an emergency procedure to crank the source back in if it ever got stuck. But anyway, so, yeah. So the only power needed for the cobalt machine is just for the gantry movement and for the head coming in and out. Yeah, and there's a light field in here to, to, that represents the radiation field. So you can turn the light on and it represents the field. Because there's collimators in here that move in and out, that block the radiation in X and Y directions. Uh, this, this head rotates around, so there's some motors in there too. So you don't need much power. And this thing, I mean, this thing is used in a lot of third world countries because it just doesn't break down. You know? um, so that's that's the beginning of radiotherapy, is a cobalt, cobalt machine. And how, 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 when do you replace it? Like the source, the half-life of cobalt is 1.2, uh, sorry, the half-life of cobalt is 5.2 uh, to 5 years. So do you like replace it every 5 years? Approximately, or? yeah. Because otherwise the treatments take too long. So when we calculate, when we calculate the treatment time, uh, of course the dose depends on the time that the source is out. Okay? So if the source is out longer, you get out longer dose. So when you calculate the, the dose, you always have to factor in the activity of this, the dose. Okay, so as the activity drops, the treatment time goes up to correct, to uh, treat the same dose. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so I mean, it's kind of a big deal to replace that, to replace the source. The guys who go around replacing these sources, they only work six months because in the replacement process, they get so much dose themselves that uh, they get their legal limit. So after about six months, they have to stop replacing the source and. They go work in the office or something. Okay, so, sorry, 5.27 years. Uh, the, it emits 1.25 MeV gammas and it's shielded in the, in the unit. Okay, so that's cobalt therapy. Particle therapy is particle versus photons. So particles are, are anything that has mass and sometimes has charge. Uh, so neutron therapy, is not that common. We actually, there is a neutron therapy clinic in the area, and it is in, it's in Fermilab. And uh, they treat patients with neutrons. And you can create neutrons by two different methods. Uh, deuterium tritium generated, DT generated. And the way you do that is you accelerate deuterons. Uh, and deuterons are particles that are, um, there's a, um, uh, deuterium is, is, is kind of like hydrogen with an extra, with an extra um, neutron. So hydrogen is just a proton, electron. Deuterium is a proton, a neutron, and an electron. Okay. So it has an atomic mass of two. And uh, it's accelerated to a few hundred keV. We can accelerate them because there's a proton and it has a charge, so we can accelerate it. 
and we direct these deuterons to a tritium target, and the neutron kinetic, and then it produces neutrons. And the kinetic energy of the neutron is 14 MeV. And that's really the only energy you get from DT generated. Uh, and then the, the penetration is similar to cobalt 60. So similar to 1.25 MeV photons. This, by the way, does not penetrate too deep. It's not very practical. The reason you don't see them these days, to, or they're, they're not that common, is because they just don't penetrate enough. They don't get deep enough. Uh, then you can also create neutrons through cyclotrons. You can accelerate protons or deuterons into a beryllium target. And then the neutron energy depends on the incident particle energy. So the more energy you, you give to the protons, the more energy the neutrons will have. And then besides neutrons, you can have you can treat patients with protons and deuterons and strip nuclei and negative prime essence. So there's a whole sort of um, particle therapy that, that uh, patients can get treated with. These are not these are not that common. This isn't common. That's not common. The most common one is here, is protons. And there's a proton facility opening up in the area, in the south, southwest suburbs. So a little bit about proton therapy. Uh, protons, protons are obviously charged, and they're, they have mass. Okay? So they interact, and they interact through the material and very heavily. So they develop, they deposit a lot of, a lot of energy because they're massive. But, they don't interact right away. So as they enter the material, as a proton enters the material, it'll do nothing, it won't interact very much, and then it'll drop all of its dose in a Bragg peak. In its Bragg peak. Well, kind of like electrons, electrons do the same thing. So it'll deposit, it'll deposit some dose at the beginning, and then it'll deposit most of its dose at a, Bragg, at a certain distance. And this distance depends on the energy that this is accelerating. So this depends on energy of the proton. So this distance depends, so the distance is proportional to the energy of the proton. Okay, and that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing a whole bunch of bright peaks. Here's the highest proton acceleration, here's, and then as you're, and the way they, the way they create all these peaks is they don't really accelerate the protons at different energies, but they use this moderator wheel. Okay, it's this wheel, with pieces of different thicknesses. So something with a big thickness, the protons have to go through it and they're going to lose energy as they go through. As they met this, as they go out at the other end, they have less energy than the proton that didn't have anything in the way. Okay, so the protons that go through a thick part of the wheel are here, and the protons that don't go through any part of the wheel are here. Okay, so they use this moderator wheel. And it looks like there's some um, I don't know how well I can draw this, but there's pieces that are that look like this, and they have different thicknesses, and they can spin it depending depending on how thick you want. They can spin it and they can turn it to a different position, and, and the protons will uh, interact with different thicknesses. So the purpose of having all these peaks within the patient is to spread out the dose. Okay? So if you just have one peak here. You're dumping all the dose in one little spot at one uh, one depth, but your tumor, well, a tumor could be thick, right? has it can have depth. So the purpose of spreading these out is to treat the entire tumor. Okay? And I mean I didn't mention this, but this is the y-axis is the relative dose, and the x-axis is the depth in water or in, or in the patient. So in this case, this, this is called the spread out bright peak, SOBP, spread out back bright peak. So in this case, uh, the tumor would, be, would go from a depth of about 5 cm to a depth of 10 cm. Okay, and we're treating that whole depth of the tumor. Now, here's the big advantage of protons. Number one, there's no exit dose. Look at that. Okay, so you can treat the tumor here and then treat nothing beyond that. This is not the case with protons. And we'll see that. And with protons, is a big exit dose. And the entrance, there's a little bit of entrance dose, but it's not that bad. It looks like it's the sum of all these bright peaks. So when patients are, are treated with protons, they're usually just treated with one single beam. And they'll lie on the table, and the beam will come from one side or the other. And then one day they'll come in, and the beam will come in from this side, and another day for, for, uh, for prostate therapy, for example. The beam will come from one side, and then the next day they'll come, I'll come in from the other side. And they'll shoot two beams. 
Okay, and this is an example of the what we call the percentage depth dose curve. You're going to see a lot of these. Percentage depth dose curve is a curve that tells us how deep something penetrates, how how um, how deep the dose is. So on the y-axis uh, we have a, a relative dose, and on the x-axis is depth. It's a little blurry, but it says depth here. And we have different modalities that we use to treat, or different particles and, and different energies of photons. So let's go through some of these. Um, the neutron we talked about already, there's the PDD for neutron. So what this means is that neutrons deposit a lot of dose right at the surface. Look at that. Depth is small. A lot of dose is deposited at the surface, but as neutrons penetrate, they interact with the material and the dose deposition drops off. Okay. Um, then we have A and B x-rays. So A, so x-rays with a spectrum of AMEB, maximum energy of AMEB, will look like this. Photons will the surface dose is low, but then there's a buildup region that builds up, and then there's a maximum dose, and then it drops off because of attenuation. Photons get attenuated. And the dose deposition at deeper depth is not as great as shallow depths. Okay. Electrons are over here. Electron irradiation. So electrons again build up, maximum dose, and they drop off very quickly. But the penetration of electrons are not like the AMV X rays. So with AMV X rays, we can treat tumors at 10 cm deep and still give a pretty good dose. Well, elect electrons don't reach that. Okay. Uh, protons completely different. A very low entrance dose, and then they build up to a bright peak and dump all their energy here. Okay. And then there's a, there's a news video that you guys can cut and paste. Uh, one disadvantage about protons is that they may deliver, this is a little controversial, people are discussing this now, protons may deliver a, whole, a higher whole body dose. So as they're getting irradiated, the protons are interacting with all the machines, and with the patient itself, and the couch, they're creating neutrons. These neutrons are adding to the whole body dose for the patient. And say the guy is only getting treated for prostate therapy, he doesn't need a whole body dose, he just needs the dose in the prostate. So it looks like protons are, the disadvantage of protons is a, is a higher whole body dose than any other modality. So that's, oh, and here's the moderator wheel that I was trying to draw before. This is kind of hard to see, but this is a CT scan, it's a single slice of a CT scan. Through here, the femoral heads, femoral head, femoral head, um, and this is a prostate right here. This is a pubic synthesis right here, and this is prostate. This red outline is an outline that the doctor drew, and um, these colored lines are what we call isodose lines. So it tells us where the dose is going. So this is a this is probably a screen cap of a treatment plan computer, treatment planning computer, and we're seeing how with proton therapy we just treat from two sides like this. You're going to see. Even once you start getting into treatment planning, with photon therapy, you come in from many different angles. Okay. Now, uh, medical linear accelerators. So that's a picture of a linear. Oh, this is somewhere. I think this is somewhere I worked. Oh, this is uh, Scobie Hospital. Yeah, that's Scobie Hospital. Linac at Scobie Hospital. So medical linear accelerators are look like this. There's a treatment couch, and then again, there's a gantry that rotates around, and, and a treatment head. Um, and we'll discuss how, how radiation is created in there to treat the patients. So for uh, medical linear accelerators, we have a selection of photon energies, usually two photons, six and ten. For, this is a variant machine, by the way. There are three main, main manufacturers of, of linear accelerators. So variant is the one that sells the most. Then uh, number two is probably Electa right now. And number three is probably Siemens. It's a big German company that sells all kinds of stuff from, from egg beaters to linear accelerators. So those are the big three. And there's also tomotherapy. And tomotherapy are out of Wisconsin, they're out of Madison. They was, I remember visiting them back, I think it was 1994, I went down there. We were just doing a site visit for actually brachytherapy, nothing to do with tomo. And I talked to, I met Brock Mackey down there. And I was talking to him because I'm Canadian, he's Canadian. And we were talking about visas and how you know, how he got his visa and how I got my visa. He goes, by the way, have you heard of tomotherapy? So no. He goes, well, it's something I'm working on. And it's, and it, tomotherapy is exactly what it sounds. You're treating, you're, tomographic means you're treating slice by slice. Tomo means slice. So he's, the idea was to mount a linear accelerator, kind of like this, but a small version of it. 
on a rotating gastery and treat the patient in a circular manner. So back then, that's when he was still working on it, back in 94 or so. And that he, his idea became a big company. And he sold tomotherapy units all over the world. Uh, and it's an amazing machine because it produces a very, very um, informal dose. So you could treat the tumor very with tight, uh, tight uh, dose conformity and spare everything else. So hey, anyway, those are the big ones. Varian, Electa, Siemens, and Tomotherapy, uh, the big four. So with a regular linear accelerator, you have photon images you'll typically see is 6, 10, sometimes you'll see 18 MP. And then you also you can also create electrons with a linear accelerator, and you usually have more energies from 6 to 20 MP. A uh, quick history of medical Linux. So, um, let's see. So in 1931, Van de Graaff generators were limited to 2 MeV. So they created photons up to 2 MeV. In 1940, the beta term was invented. It created high, it was very high energy, but a very small fit size. In 1937, and here's where Varian comes in, the Varian brothers, Russell and Sigurd, created a device powerful enough to detect low-flying aircraft. So what was happening back here is that the war was driving a lot of research. And why was war driving research in this area? is because they, were, they needed to create radio frequency power that they could send out and then wait and listen. So if they could send out, and that's what radar is, it's high power radio frequency waves that are sent out, and if you get something that bounces back, you know there's something out there, and it's a blip. So they created this high power device that created 30 kilowatt uh, radio frequency power to detect low flying aircraft, which is the radar. And then in 1952, the first 30 megawatt, so we're going from 30, in 1937 kilowatts to 30 megawatts, and a klystron is a high power amplifier for radio frequency waves. In 1952, the first patient was treated uh, by Dr. Gray in London, and he used a two megawatt magnetron. We'll talk about these devices in a minute. And a nine foot wave got really big one. In 1956, the first patient was treated in the United States with a one megawatt klystron, and in 62, the first isocentric linac was used in Stanford. Isocentric means that we can rotate now around the patient. Does the dose unit come from Dr. Gray? Yeah, it does. Okay. So just a summary of how, how a LINAC operates. In linear accelerators, electrons are accelerated along straight trajectory, trajectories in special evacuated cavities called accelerating wave beds. So it starts with electrons being accelerated. Then photons are produced by placing a metal target in the beam of accelerated electrons, thus forming Bremschel. Okay, so Linux are treating our patients with this, this uh, white radiation. Then a flattening filter is in the head of the machine and that renders the beam flat. And we'll talk about why that when we need that. And then you can also treat electrons by removing the metal target, by removing this target, and the flattening filter and replacing them with a thin scattering foil. And the foil spreads out the electron beam. So basically, that's how a LINAC works. And here's a schematic of it. Um, have you guys been uh, in a treatment room, a radiotherapy treatment room? You guys, right, for intro? Did you go to intro to clinic yesterday? Did you go to the right hospital? <laughs> <laughs> so you got to meet one of these, right? You got to meet a LINAC? Okay, so you know kind of how it works and how big it is and how it rotates. and. I mean, it's, it's amazing the technology that goes into this, and we're going to talk about this part by part. And um, so, let's see, let's start out here. So th these are some components that are inside, either inside the actual gantry or outside in the cabinet. There's another cabinet. And, um, and it all starts with, uh, there's this RF driver that produces radio frequency, uh, the radio frequency signal. And it, it, this signal drives the cluster. The klystron takes the radius, the low power radio frequency, and then it also receives high power pulses from the modulator. So it's in low power radio frequency, high power pulses. Um, it gets pretty hot, so there's a cooling water system. And then there's a circulator, and I'm not going to talk about that now, but I'll talk about it in a little while. And then this this klystron produces, and we're going to talk about the klystron in more depth next lecture, so don't think I'm going to ignore it today. This klystron basically takes the radio frequency waves here and the high power pulses here and takes those and amplifies it. So the klystron is a power amplifier of radio frequency waves. 
So it amplifies it, and then it sends it down a waveguide. So this RF power goes down this RF waveguide. Did you guys see this? Did, did uh, Theo open the cabinets to show you this stuff? Well, you, you'll get to see it. The klystron sends this RF power down a waveguide, and then that waveguide uh, is connected to the accelerating structure. So the RF power goes from, from the waveguide to the accelerating structure and fills the structure with high power radio frequency waves. So the high power radio frequency waves are there to accelerate electrons. Okay? And then the electrons come from the electron gun. The electron gun is kind of like the filament that we saw in the diagnostic tubes. So the electron gun, gun supplies electrons for acceleration in the structure. Okay, okay so one more time. Uh, radio frequency, uh, we're going to get into what frequency those are, those are in a minute. Produced by the RF driver, modulator, high pulses. By the way, the modulator also, there should be an arrow that feeds the electron gun. So the modulator feeds the electron gun and the klystron with, with pulses. And there's a switch. If you'll see, it's a really neat thing if you open the ca cabinet. There's a high voltage switch. And this switch looks like a big old vacuum tube. And it glows blue. And that's called a thyrotron. So that's a switch that, that all this, the modulator is made up of a capacitor inductor network that fills up a lot of charge, and then the switch dumps all that charge into the klystron. So the klystron accelerates it, I'm sorry, the klystron amplifies it, and then the electrons that originate in the electron gun ride this wave. So these are radio frequency waves, and they ride the wave, and a wave and you'll, we'll, we'll talk about the structures, but in each, each cavity, the electrons get a boost of energy. Then by the, by the time that they've gotten all these boosts, by the time they get to reach the end of the structure, they're almost at the speed of light. They're at 99% of the speed of light. Okay, so they acquire a ton of energy in this acceleration. And so the accelerating structure, there's a very high vacuum. There's a vacuum pump that lives in the head of the lunette. It's always pulling vacuum. Uh, they're focusing coils to make sure that the electron beam that's being, that's being accelerated are, is focused and tight. And then there's steering coils, and that, that steers the electron beam left and right or up and down to make sure it's right in there. And then, after the electrons are accelerated and they've got a lot of energy, then they enter this thing called a bending magnet. And the bending magnet have, uh, has energy slits that are little, that are little metal apertures so if there's some electrons that are strained that aren't the right energy, they, scrape, they get scraped off. So the energy slits are there to maintain a certain window of energy. Okay, so if, for example, if some, some electrons are being bent, and I'll, and I'll talk about the bending magnet in a minute, but what happens is that electrons, they move in this direction, and then they get bent over 270 degrees, and they, they come out this way. Okay. Why, why wouldn't we have an accelerating structure that points straight down? Well, just because this, these structures are pretty big, and the gantry would have to be huge, and the gantry would have to be would have to come underground. Either that, I mean, imagine if the imagine if the accelerating structure was this way, like pointing this way, and the photons or the electrons are coming this way. Um, then the the patient's bed, let's see, the patient's bed would have to be so that, and then this this thing would have to rotate around. So the longer this is, the longer this is, the higher the bed, patient's bed would have to be, so that this part here could clear the floor. Because as this comes around, um, the isocenter of this, the distance between the isocenter of rotation and the back of this structure, if this if this structure is really long, this distance is going to be really big. So that, which means that this distance from here to the floor would have to be big, so it clears it. Okay, and usually. We treat, we, this is where we put the patient, at the isocenter. So we'd have to put the patient here, and again, as I said, if this is really long, we'd, the patient would, would probably be like up here. So the patient would have to climb a ladder to get treated. Not practical. Either that, or we'd have to dig holes in the floor. Also not practical. So what they did is they turned this on its side. They turned it on its side, just like it is up there. It's on its side, and they put a bending magnet. And now, the electrons, they don't come out this way, they come out this way, and they bend over 270 degrees, and they come out this way. And also, the bending magnet doesn't focus on some electron focusing. It's 
So why is it a, why couldn't a, why couldn't make it in such a way that the electrons can bend by ninety degrees? Why yeah, you can. There were bending magnets that were ninety degrees. There were. The problem with a ninety degree bending magnet, and I'll get it, I'll get into bending magnets in more detail, and I'll, I'll show you what that is. Um, is that here are the here are the electrons. Now the electrons that are that are being accelerated, they're pretty much all the same energy, but there's a bit of an energy spread. Okay, there's some low energies and there's some high energies. When you bend electrons. The, um, the low energy electrons will be bent the most. Okay, so the low energy electrons will come this way, and the high energy electrons will be bent the least. And they'll come this way. And what happens is that you end up having a big source. Okay, so what, to create the photons, remember what we did is we put a target, and the electrons hit the target and create Bremsstrahlung. So if, if you've got an energy spread and you bend it 90 degrees, some will hit the source here, some will hit the source here, and we get the big source that we don't want. It creates that big number we don't want. So if you bend it 270 degrees, that actually gets refocused. Okay. Um, so the, the the high energy ones do this, and then they, they cross over, and the low energy ones are in here, and they cross over, and they actually get refocused down to a point. Okay. So that's the advantage of a, of a 270. Okay, frequency. Uh, frequency of radio waves that give electrons their energy. So there's three three major frequency ranges that we use, the L-band, S-band, and X-band. This right here is the most common. So most Linux will be in this band right here. 2856 20, megahertz, that's a really high energy. Okay, this is the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation inside the waveguide and the frequency of the radio frequency driver. Remember that R driver? That's the frequency. Uh, the X band, have you guys heard of a CyberKnife machine? CyberKnife? CyberKnife uses a little Linux, and it's right here. The X -band. It uses an X band Linux. So it shrinks it and it increases the, the frequency. Uh, let's see. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll leave this. We'll do this next time. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot here. We'll do that next time. Okay. We'll get into the into more details about the parts. Slide. So we're on slide. We're going to end on slide 32, and we'll start up on 33 next class. Okay. Any questions? All right. Now, did Matt get in touch with you guys regarding the Skype sessions? And then he did. Okay. I asked him to send me your email, so I'll uh, I'll remind him to get in touch with you. Either he's going to leave it up to you. either he does the Skype session this week and reviews the assignment this week, or he does it next week when you guys have your assignment back. Uh, and that way you can have your assignment in front of you and you can ask questions about how you did. And that might be more, more productive. So, so I think he's going to do it that way. All right. How's the, um, how's the typing? Typing the assignments up, is that okay? Uh, for some reason, I don't have uh, equation 3.1 in Microsoft Word. Oh, you don't? Yeah. Do you have any equation? Do you have? I, I don't have anything at all, so I just did it the old school way and I just typed it. That's what I do for most time. Like, 